morning, church. Have you ever felt really instantly seen by someone? Like they somehow took you in fully with a look? A few years ago, I was in the South, I was in my 20s, and I was very recently out and transitioning. And because of all of that, I was hyper aware of the way that everyone around me saw me. And of course, that was at its worst on my train ride to work, where everyone is packed in like sardines, and it seems like you could stare at your feet and still make awkward eye contact with a stranger. <laughs> But on this one day, my seatmate and I uh, just happened to click. He and I had that kind of like instant camaraderie that made it easy for us to open up to one another. And we talked about our job troubles, our relationships, our plans for the future, uh, pretty much all the ground you can cover on one commute. And when I got up to leave, we said goodbyes and we wished each other well. And then he said, you know, you seem like a really nice, and a word starting with G. And I tensed up and I thought, is he going to say a really nice guy, a really nice girl? Uh, and then he tensed up because he realized he was about to roll the dice on either validating me or ruining my day. And I could definitely see that in his face. Uh, After a second, he relaxed and he finished as confidently as the rest of our conversation had gone. You seem like a really nice whatever. <laughs> and in a different mood, maybe coming from someone I hadn't just connected with in the same way, that probably would have ruined my day. But something about the way he said it had me beaming as I got off the train instead. I am a really nice whatever. I wanted it on a business card or something, like Brielle Gardner, really nice whatever. <laughs> It's one of the first times uh, I ever felt seen by a stranger in that time in my transition. I wasn't being politely humored or gawked at, but I was being really and fully recognized for who I was. Uh, I'm sure all of you have had that experience of feeling seen, and just in case you haven't recently, turn to the person next to you and say, I see you. That's nice, right? It's like uh, the rain we were blessed with this past week, finally, after the fires. Uh, all of the haze falls out of the air, and you remember what breathing easy feels like again. Even if the very next day you get a head cold and forget again. <laughs> Good one, God. Our scripture readings today are also about being seen. They're about the way uh, Jesus is seen and fails to be seen by the crowds, by his disciples, and by Pontius Pilate, his would-be judge. Uh, in the reading from Mark, the disciples recount all the hot gossip they've heard, all the things people say that this Jesus guy might be. Is he one of the old prophets back from the dead? Maybe he's John the Baptist. Maybe he's Elijah? The crowds are confused and mistaken about him. Some of them seem to get it half right, But Jesus doesn't correct them or lay down a lesson. Instead, he asks his own beloved community of disciples to answer for themselves, what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter finally answers, you are the Messiah. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all record this dialogue, and they all include the same response from Jesus. He says, you're right, and you must not tell anyone about this. He knows it can be a dangerous thing, revealing who you are to those who don't understand it fully, who don't see you. He knows it can be deadly. In front of Pilate, Jesus has a completely different kind of conversation. Pilate demands that Jesus give himself up as a rabble-rouser. Are you the king of the Jews? Meaning, to Pilate at least, are you claiming to be a rival political power? But it's an impossible question to answer. Jesus is king, but not of any kingdom that Pilate is concerned about. He has come to end the grip of empire, but not as a ruler or as an insurgent. Whatever he says, his answer won't be heard. And his failure to be heard, to be seen, leads to the horror of the crucifixion, torture and murder demanded by the mob and co-signed by the state. With the rise in hate crimes and mass violence in the last few years, Uh, I, couldn't hear, I couldn't help but uh, hear Pilate's questions in the tone of the bully, the catcaller, and the bigot. What are you? You must be delusional. The trial also brings to mind all of the legal turmoil in our country, being endlessly whipped up and then discarded and then whipped up again for debate, eliminating birthright citizenship, 
redefining and narrowing the concept of legal sex to allow anti-trans discrimination. Because all of that rhetoric is born out of a time where it can seem impossible to see one another. It's just good politics and good business to encourage a worldview made out of strict binaries, one that puts a mask over the human face of the other side so that we can pretend we're shouting at an embodied idea and not a person. There's even a popular political meme called the NPC based on the idea that people on the other side are just mindless automatons so that its users can prop themselves up as free thinkers in a debate. In the face of that dehumanization and these dangerous and very real political possibilities, many of our leaders seem to be either actively egging them on or washing their hands of the problem, ignoring the responsibility to fight against death-dealing systems of oppression and violence. And the same now as it was 2,000 years ago, our refusal to see one another ends up being deadly. This past Tuesday, we observed a vigil for the Trans Day of Remembrance here in the sanctuary. Up here on the chancel, we practiced the traditional ritual of reading the long list of names of the people killed by transphobic violence in the last year. As it turns out, that day, especially the practice of reading names, has been controversial in the trans community, especially in the last few years. In some ways, that controversy is well-earned. In a lot of places, it's still the only day of the year where trans identities in particular are brought to the foreground. Is this really the one way we get to lift up and acknowledge trans people and transness through the year? Lifting up and acknowledging us only after we're dead? Only after violence done by those who so completely failed to see us that they failed to even see that we're worthy of life? We need that lament, of course. We need space to grieve. We need a way to give our hopes for a more just world up to each other and to God. But stopping there is like a Good Friday with no Easter afterward. It hands victory over to the people who still don't see us, who pretend not to. We have to remember our dead, but we also have to remember ourselves to put one another back together to continue struggling and loving together. And that's why, along with the practice of remembrance of the dead, uh, many of us now observe a trans day of resilience, like today, uh, a day for celebrating the trans folks we still have with us and the gifts and joys that the trans experience can offer. And joys is the operative word here. Too often, transness is reduced down to gender dysphoria, um, that pain of feeling a mismatch between our own identity and the role assigned to us at birth. Uh, that word dysphoria literally means bearing pain uh, or bearing unhappiness. But there's also gender euphoria, bearing goodness, the feeling of triumph that comes from bearing the good news that you can be recognized for who you are. I've seen gender euphoria on a newly out girl's face the first time I took her shopping for a skirt. I felt it myself the first time I heard someone actually casually use Brie to refer to me. A friend of mine once described transition as the closest thing to resurrection I'll get to experience this side of the second coming. As wonderful as that all is, I recognize that we're not all trans here, although I do hold to a strict don't knock it till you've tried it policy. <laughs> and I do carry holographic eyeshadow in my bag if you're curious. <laughs> but either way, it's important to know this. Who sees you? Who in your community do you know who is bearing pain from not being seen? How can we strengthen one another? The Reverend Elizabeth Edmond points out the ways that the queer experience, including the trans experience, mirrors the Christian one. Both require these things to be lived fully. Discerning a God-given identity, taking on that identity, and living it honestly and out in the open, knowing full well the risk of scandal that entails, and bringing one another into community to care for one another and be cared for. And it makes sense that those experiences would be the same, we worship a God of transitions, a God who bucks every binary she encounters, eternal, unchanging, and always doing something brand new, loving and fearsome in pursuit of justice, king of all and servant of all, humanly vulnerable and divinely resilient. In both cases, the queer life and the Christian one, and the one that's a little bit of each, 
The process doesn't just end at know thyself. That's step one of many. As Rachel so beautifully illustrated, we are made resilient on our way by reaching out, by knowing one another at our roots. When bigotry or depression or dysphoria tell us that the way we are is broken, we have the example of Jesus, who sought out his beloved community and asked, who do you say I am? When others demand that you explain yourself, when they ask, what are you, while refusing to hear the response, we can look to a teacher who knew better than to answer an unanswerable question. Becoming resilient with one another in that way takes work. It takes uncovering the ways we're still made nearsighted by colonialism and patriarchy. It takes understanding and working on the unflattering parts of ourselves. For white folks, it might mean examining our, uh, sorry, that might be the part still tainted by white supremacy and white fragility. Um, for cis folks, it might mean examining your discomfort with using gender neutral pronouns, uh, or even just discomfort being around gender non-conforming people. In other words, it takes recognizing the Pontius Pilate in our heads. The part of us so stuck in the world of empires and the old caste systems of race and gender that we can't recognize each other as children of the same God. But once we recognize it, we can say, our kingdom is of another world. Amen.